Varney the Vampire, or the Feast of Blood. <laughs> Written by Thomas Prescott Prest and James Malcolm Reimer. Narrated by Edward E. French. Chapter 4. The Morning, the Consultation, the Fearful Suggestion. What wonderfully different impressions and feelings with regard to the same circumstances come across the mind in the broad, clear, and beautiful light of day to what haunt the imagination and often render the judgment almost incapable of action when the heavy shadow of night is upon all things. There must be a downright physical reason for this effect. It is so remarkable and so universal. It seems that the sun's rays so completely alter and modify the constitution of the atmosphere that it produces, as we inhale it, a wonderfully different effect upon the nerves of the human subject. We can account for this phenomenon in no other way. Perhaps never in his life had he, Henry Bannerworth, felt so strongly this transition of feeling as he now felt it when the beautiful daylight gradually dawned upon him as he kept his lonely watch by the bedside of his slumbering sister. That watch had been a perfectly undisturbed one. Not the least sight or sound of any intrusion had reached his senses. All had been as still as the very grave. And yet while the night lasted, and he was more indebted to the rays of the candle which he had placed upon a shelf for the power to distinguish objects than to the light of the morning. A thousand uneasy and strange sensations had found a home in his agitated bosom. He looked so many times at the portrait which was in the panel that at length he felt an undefined sensation of terror creep over him whenever he took his eyes off it. He tried to keep himself from looking at it, but he found it vain. So he adopted what, perhaps, was certainly the wisest, best plan, namely, to look at it continually. He shifted his chair so that he could gaze upon it without any effort, and he placed the candle so that a faint light was thrown upon it, and there he sat, a prey to many conflicting and uncomfortable feelings, until the daylight began to make the candle flame look dull and sickly. Solution for the events of the night he could find none. He racked his imagination in vain to find some means, however vague, of endeavoring to account for what occurred, and still he was at fault. All was to him wrapped in the gloom of the most profound mystery. And how strangely, too, the eyes of that portrait appeared to look upon him as if instinct with life, and as if the head to which they belonged was busy in endeavoring to find out the secret communings of his soul. It was wonderfully well executed, that portrait, so lifelike that the very features seemed to move as you gazed upon them. It shall be removed, said Henry. I would remove it now, but that it seems absolutely painted on the panel, and I should awake Flora in any attempt to do so. He arose and ascertained that such was the case, and that it would require a workman with proper tools adapted to the job to remove the portrait. True, he said, I might now destroy it, but it is a pity to obscure a work of such rare art as this is. I should blame myself if I were. It shall be removed to some other room of the house, however. Then all of a sudden it struck Henry how foolish it would be to remove the portrait from the wall of a room which, in all likelihood, after that night would be uninhabited, for it was not probable that Flora would choose again to inhabit a chamber in which she had gone through so much terror. It can be left where it is, he said, and we can fasten up, if we please, even the very door of this room, so that no one need trouble themselves any further about it. The morning was now coming fast, and just as Henry thought he would partially draw a blind across the window in order to shield from the direct rays of the sun the eyes of Flora, she awoke. Help! Help! she cried, and Henry was at her side in a moment. You are safe, Flora. You are safe, he said. Where is it now? she said. What? What, dear Flora? The dreadful apparition! Oh, what if I done to be made thus perpetually miserable? Think no more of it, Flora. I must think. My brain is on fire. A million of strange eyes seem gazing on me. 
Great heaven, she raves, said Henry. Hark, hark, hark! He comes on the wings of the storm. It is most horrible, horrible! Henry rang the bell, but not sufficiently loudly to create any alarm. The sound reached the waking ear of the mother, who, in a few moments, was in the room. She has awakened, said Henry, and has spoken, but she seems to me to wander in her discourse. For God's sake, soothe her, and try to bring her mind round to its usual state. I will, Henry, I will. And I think, mother, if you were to get her out of this room and into some other chamber as far removed from this one as possible, it would tend to withdraw her mind from what has occurred. Yes, it shall be done. Oh, Henry, what was it? What do you think it was? I'm lost in a sea of wild conjecture. I can form no conclusion. Where is Mr. Marchdale? I believe in his chamber. Then I will go and consult with him. Henry proceeded at once to the chamber, which was, as he knew, occupied by Mr. Marchdale, and as he crossed the corridor he could not but pause a moment to glance from a window at the face of nature. As is often the case, the terrific storm of the preceding evening had cleared the air and rendered it deliciously invigorating and lifelike. The weather had been dull, and there had been for some days a certain heaviness in the atmosphere, which was now entirely removed. The morning sun was shining with uncommon brilliancy. Birds were singing in every tree and on every bush. So pleasant, so spirit-stirring, health-giving a morning seldom had he seen. And the effect upon his spirits was great, although not altogether what it might have been, had all gone as it usually was in the habit of doing at that house. The ordinary little casualties of evil fortune had certainly from time to time, in the shape of illness and one thing or another attacked the family of Bannerworths in common with every other family. But here suddenly had arisen a something at once terrible and inexplicable. It was not until midday that Henry made up his mind he would call in a medical gentleman to her. And then he rode to the neighboring market town, where he knew an extremely intelligent practitioner resided. This gentleman Henry resolved upon under a promise of secrecy, makings confident of, but... Long before he reached him, he found he might as well dispense with the promise of secrecy. He had never thought, so engaged had he been with other matters, that the servants were cognizant of the whole affair, and that from them he had no expectation of being able to keep the whole story in all its details. Of course, such an opportunity for tale-bearing and gossiping was not likely to be lost. And while Henry was thinking over how he had better act in the matter, the news that Flora Bannerworth had been visited in the night by a vampire, for the servants named the visitation such at once, was spreading all over the country. As he rode along, Henry met a gentleman on horseback who belonged to the county, and who, reining in his steed, said to him, "'Good morning, Mr. Bannerworth.' "'Good morning,' responded Henry. And he would have ridden on, but the gentleman added, "'Excuse me for interrupting you, sir, but what is the strange story that is in everybody's mouth about a vampire?' Henry nearly fell off his horse, he was so much astonished, and, wheeling the animal about, he said, "'In everybody's mouth?' "'Yes, I have heard it from at least a dozen persons.' "'You surprise me. Is it untrue?' "'Of course I am not so absurd as to really believe about the vampire. But is there no foundation for all of it?' We generally find that at the bottom of these common reports there is something around which, as a nucleus, the whole has formed. My sister is unwell. Ah, and that's all. It really is too bad now. We, we had a visitor last night. A thief, I suppose. Yes, yes, I, I believe a, a thief. I do believe it was a thief, and she was terrified. Of course. And upon such a thing is grafted a story of a vampire, and the marks of his teeth being in her neck, and all the circumstantial particulars. Yes, yes. Good morning, Mr. Bannerworth. Henry bade the gentleman good morning, and much vexed at the publicity which the affair had already obtained, he set spurs to his horse, determined that he would speak to no one else upon so uncomfortable a theme. Several attempts were made to stop him, but he only waved his hand and trotted on, nor did he pause in his speed till he reached the door of Mr. Chillingworth, the medical man, whom he intended to consult. 
and we knew that at such a time he would be home, which was the case. And he was soon closeted with the man of drugs, and rebegged his patient hearing, which being accorded, he related to him at full length what had happened, not omitting, to the best of his remembrance, any one particular. When he had concluded his narration, the doctor shifted his position several times, and then said, That's all? Yes, and enough, too. More than enough, I should say, my young friend. You astonish me. Can you form any supposition, sir, on the subject? Mm, not just now. What is your own idea? I cannot be said to have one about it. It is too absurd to tell you that my brother George is impressed with the belief that a, a vampire has visited the house. I had never in all my life heard a more circumstantial narrative in favor of so hideous a superstition. Well, but you cannot believe... Believe what? That the dead can come to life again, and by such a process keep up vitality. Do you take me for a fool? Certainly not. Then why do you ask me such questions? But the glaring facts of the case. <laughs> well, I don't care if they were ten times more glaring. I won't believe it. I would rather believe you were all mad, the whole family of you, that at the full of the moon you all were a little cracked. And so would I. You go home now, and I will call and see your sister in the course of two hours. Something may turn up yet to throw some new light upon this strange subject. With this understanding, Henry went home, and he took care to ride as fast as before in order to avoid questions, so that he got back to his old ancestral home without going through the disagreeable ordeal of having to explain to anyone what had disturbed the peace of it. When Henry reached his home, he found that the evening was rapidly coming on, and before he could permit himself to think upon any other subject, he inquired how his terrified sister had passed the hours during his absence. He found that but little improvement had taken place in her, and that she had occasionally slept, but to awaken and speak incoherently, as if the shock she had received had had some serious effect upon her nerves. He repaired at once to her room, and, finding that she was awake, he leaned over her and spoke tenderly to her. Flora, he said, dear Flora, are you better now? Harry, is that you? Yes, dear. Oh, tell me what has happened. Have you not a recollection, Flora? Yes, yes, Henry, but what was it? They none of them will tell me what it was, Henry. Be calm, dear. No doubt, is some attempt to rob the house. You think so? Yes. The bay window was peculiarly adapted for such a purpose, but now that you are removed here to this room, you will be able to rest in peace. I shall die of terror, Henry. Even now those eyes are glaring on me so hideously. Oh, it is fearful. It is very fearful, Henry. Do you not pity me? And no one will promise to remain with me at night. Indeed, Flora, you are mistaken for I intend to sit by your bedside, armed, and so preserve you from all harm. She clutched his hand eagerly as she said, You will, Henry. You will, and not think too much trouble, dear Henry. It can be no trouble, Flora. Then I shall rest in peace, for I know that the fearful vampire cannot come to me when you are by. So what, Flora? The vampire, Henry. It was a vampire. Good God! Who told you so? No one. I have read of them in the Book of Travels in Norway, which Mr. Marchdale lent us all. Alas! Alas! groaned Henry. Discard, I pray you, such a thought from your mind. Can we discard thoughts? What power have we but from that mind, which is ourselves? True, true. Hark! What noise is that? I thought I heard a noise. Henry, when you go, ring for someone first. Was there not a noise? The accidental shutting of some door, dear. Was it that? It was. Ah, oh, then I am relieved, Henry. I sometimes fancy I am in the tomb, and that someone is feasting on my flesh. They do say, too, that those in life have been bled by a vampire, become themselves vampires, and have the same horrible, 
taste for blood as those before them. Is it not horrible? You only vex yourselves with such thoughts, Flora. Mr. Chillingworth is coming to see you. Can he minister to a mind diseased? But yours is not, Flora. Your mind is healthful. And so, although his power extends not so far, we will thank heaven, dear Flora, that you need it not. She sighed deeply as she said, Heaven help me, I know not, Henry. The dreadful being held on by my hair. I must have it all taken off. I tried to get away, but it, it dragged me back. A brutal thing it was. Oh, then, at that moment, Henry, I felt as if something strange took place in my brain and that I was going mad. I saw those glazed eyes come close to mine. I felt a hot, pestiferous breath upon my face. Help! Help! Hush, my Flora, hush! Look at me. I am calm again. It fixed its teeth in my throat. Did I faint away? You did, dear. But let me pray you refer all this to imagination, or at least the greater part of it. But you saw it. Yes. All saw it. We all saw some man, a housebreaker. It must have been some housebreaker. What more easy, you know, dear Flora, than to assume some such disguise? Was anything stolen? Not that I know of. But there was an alarm, you know. Flora shook her head as she said in a low voice, That which came here was more than mortal. Oh, Henry, if it had but killed me, now I had been happy. But I cannot live. I hear it breathing now. Talk of something else, dear Flora, said the much distressed Henry. You will make yourself much worse if you indulge yourself in these strange fancies. Oh, that they were but fancies. They are, believe me. There is a strange confusion in my brain, and sleep comes over me suddenly. When I least expect it, Henry, Henry, what I was, I shall never, never be again. Say not so. All this will pass away like a dream, and leave so faint a trace upon your memory that the time will come when you will wonder it ever made so deep an impression on your mind. You utter these words, Henry, she said, but they do not come from your heart. Ah, <laughs> no, no, no. Who comes? The door was opened by Mrs. Bannerworth, who said, It's only me, my dear. Henry, here is Dr. Chillingworth in the dining room. Henry turned to Flora, saying, You will see him, dear Flora? You know Mr. Chillingworth well. Yes, Henry, yes, I will see him. Or whoever you please. Show Mr. Chillingworth up, said Henry to the servant. In a few moments the medical man was in the room, and he at once approached the bedside to speak to Flora, upon whose pale countenance he looked with evident interest, while at the same time it seemed mingled with a painful feeling. At least so his face indicated. Well, Miss Bannerworth, he said, what is all this I hear about an ugly dream you've had? A dream, said Flora, as she fixed her beautiful eyes on his face. Yes, as I understand. She shuddered and was silent. Was it not a dream, then? added Mr. Chillingworth. She wrung her hands and, in a voice of extreme anguish and pathos, said, Would it were a dream! Would it were a dream! Oh, if anyone could but convince me it was a dream! Well, will you tell me what it was? Yes, sir. It was a vampire. Mr. Chillingworth glanced at Henry as he said in reply to Flora's words, I suppose that is, after all, another name, Flora, for the nightmare? No, no, no. Do you really then persist in believing anything so absurd, Miss Bannerworth? What can I say to the evidence of my own senses, she replied. I saw it, Henry saw it, George saw. Mr. Marchdale, my mother, all saw it. We could not all at the same time be victims of the same delusion. How faintly you speak. I am very faint and ill. Indeed. What wound is that on your neck? A wild expression came over the face of Flora, a spasmodic action of the muscles, accompanied with a shuddering, as if a sudden chill had come over the whole mass of blood took place, and she said, it is the mark left by the teeth of the vampire. The smile was a forced one upon the face of Mr. Chillingworth. 
draw up the blind of the window, Mr. Henry, he said, and let me examine this puncture to which your sister attaches so extraordinary a meaning. The blind was drawn up and a strong light was thrown into the room. For a full two minutes, Mr. Chillingworth attentively examined the two small wounds in the neck of Flora. He took a powerful magnifying glass from his pocket and looked at them through it. And after his examination was concluded, he said, They are very trifling wounds, indeed. But how inflicted, said Henry. By some insect, I should say, which probably, it being season for many insects, has flown in at the window. I know the motive, said Flora, which prompts all these suggestions. It is a kind one, and I ought to be the last to quarrel with it. But what I have seen, nothing can make me believe I saw not, unless I am at once or twice I have thought myself really mad. How do you feel in general health? Far from well, and a strange drowsiness at times creeps over me. Even now I feel it. She sunk back on the pillows as she spoke and closed her eyes with a deep sigh. Mr. Chillingworth beckoned Henry to come with him from the room, but the latter had promised he would remain with Flora, and as Mrs. Bannerworth had left the chamber because she was unable to control her feelings, he rang the bell and requested that his mother would come. She did so, and then Henry went downstairs along with the medical man, whose opinion he was certainly eager to be now made acquainted with. As soon as they were alone in an old-fashioned room, which was called the Oak Closet, Henry turned to Mr. Chillingworth and said, What now is your candid opinion, sir? You've seen my sister and those strange, indubitable evidences of something wrong. I have, um, to tell you candidly the truth, Mr. Henry. I am sorely perplexed. I thought you would be. It is not often that a medical man likes to say so much, nor is it indeed often prudent that he should do so, but in this case I own I am much puzzled. It is contrary to all my notions upon all such subjects. Those wounds, what do you think of them? I don't know what to think. I am completely puzzled as regards them. But do they not really bear the appearance of being bites? They really do. And so far, then, they are actually in favor of the dreadful supposition which poor Flora entertains. So far, they certainly are. I have no doubt in the world of their being bites, but we must not jump to a conclusion that the teeth which inflicted them were human. It is a strange case, and one which I feel assured must give you all much uneasiness, as indeed it gave me. But as I said before, I will not let my judgment give in to the fearful and degrading superstition which all the circumstances connected with this strange story would seem to justify. It is a degrading superstition. To my mind, your sister seems to be laboring under the effect of some narcotic. Indeed? Yes, unless she really has lost a quantity of blood, which loss has decreased the heart's action sufficiently to produce the languor under which she now evidently labors. Oh, that I could believe the former supposition. But I am confident she has taken no narcotic. She could not even do so by mistake, for there is no drug of the sort in the house. Besides, she is not heedless by any means. I am quite convinced she has not done so. Then I am fairly puzzled, my young friend and can only say that I would freely have given half of what I am worth to see that figure you saw last night. What would you have done? I would not have lost sight of it for the world's wealth. You would have felt your blood freeze with horror. The face was terrible. And yet let it lead me where I liked, I would have followed it. I wish you had been here. I wish to heaven I had. If I thought there was the least chance of another visit, I would come and wait with patience every night for a month. I cannot say, replied Henry. I am going to sit up tonight with my sister, and I believe our friend Mr. Marchdale will share my watch with me. Mr. Chillingworth appeared to be, for a few moments, lost in thought, and then suddenly rousing himself, as if he found it either impossible to come to any rational conclusion upon the subject, or had arrived at one which he chose to keep to himself, he said, well, well, we must leave the matter at present as it stands. Time may accomplish something towards its development, but at present so palpable a mystery I never came across, or a matter in which human calculation was so completely foiled. Nor I, nor I. I will send you some medicines, such as I think will be of service to Flora, and depend upon seeing me by ten o'clock tomorrow morning. 
"'You have, of course, heard something,' said Henry to the doctor as he was pulling on his gloves. "'About vampires?' "'I certainly have, and I understand that in some countries, particularly Norway and Sweden, the superstition is a very common one. "'And in the Levant?' "'Yes, the ghouls of the Mohammedans are of the same description of beings.' All that I have heard of the European vampire has made it a being which can be killed, but is restored to life again by the rays of a full moon falling on the body. Yes, yes, I have heard as much. And that the hideous repast of blood has to be taken very frequently, and that if the vampire gets it not, he wastes away, presenting the appearance of one in the last stage of consumption, and visibly, so to speak, Dying. That is what I have understood. Tonight, do you know, Mr. Bedoweth, is the full moon. Henry started. If you had succeeded in killing... Pshaw, what am I saying? I believe I am getting foolish, and that the horrible superstition is beginning to fasten itself upon me, as well as upon all of you. How strangely the fancy will wage war with the judgment in such a way as this. The full of the moon, repeated Henry, as he glanced towards the window. And the night is near at hand. Banish these thoughts from your mind, said the doctor, or else, my young friend, you will make yourself decidedly ill. Good evening to you, for it is evening. I shall see you tomorrow morning. <laughs>